Welcome everyone. This is, uh, I think we're up to uh, part nine in CAFC's webinar series, eight or nine anyways, it's tough to lose track. We just had one yesterday as well. So, uh, but uh, welcome to today's episode. Today we're uh, talking, this is the Na CAFC's National Screening Toolkit for FASD and this is our feedback and input session from Screening Toolkit users um, or for individuals who are just looking to learn more about CAFC's uh, Screening Toolkit for um, children potentially affected by FASD. Uh, my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, and I'm just going to be giving a bit of a technical introduction and helping uh, moderate some of the question and answer period today. So, and uh, so I, as you can see on the agenda, I'm just doing the, the quick welcome and introduction, and then I'm going to be handing it off to uh, Elaine Orbein. Uh, but first off, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, we do uh, record all of our webinars and post them on our Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, and already on our Knowledge Exchange Network is the uh, uh, a, a host of information uh, that we've done on FASD. Uh, we have our screen, the actual screen toolkit itself is here with all of the various screening tools that we'll be talking about today. Uh, we also have all of the previous webinars that we've done where we've brought uh, information about all of the various tools. Again, the, some of these tools we'll be talking specifically about today. Um, and uh, of course, as I mentioned, this webinar will also be posted here and we'll be sending everyone a link uh, in an email, all of the registrants and attendees that were a part of today's webinar. We'll be sending you the information on how to access this information in, in a few days. So without uh, any further ado, I'm going to hand the <coughs> virtual microphone over to uh, CAFC's President and CEO, uh, Elaine Orban. Thank you, Doug, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for our colleagues from um, Western Canada. And uh, it truly is my pleasure to welcome everyone to CAFC's webinar series. And uh, as Doug mentioned, this is our eighth webinar in our series. And today, a little bit unique, we will be focusing on our National Screening Toolkit, specifically um, welcoming um, all of our participants as well as our speakers around providing some feedback and input specific to three of our screening tools. Just a little bit of background um, for those of you that may not be as familiar with, um, uh, with the last few years of work um, that CAFC has facilitated uh, in the area of FASD. As many of you may know, on March 1st, um, back in 2005, the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder guidelines for diagnosis were published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And in fact, um, some of our speakers today, and I'm sure many of you who are joining us on the webinar, were directly involved in that very important uh, development process. The development of the guidelines were facilitated by the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada. However, when the guidelines were published, it was recognized, in fact, that there are no valid and reliable screening tools for consistent screening of children for a possible FASD. This, of course, limited the ability of healthcare um, allied professionals as well as families uh, working with children with behavioral and learning disabilities to consistently screen for FASD and refer for further assessment and diagnosis. To address this particular need or gap for valid and reliable screening tools, CAFC developed a very important partnership with the Public Health Agency of Canada as well as First Nations Inuit Health Branch Health Canada and our National FASD Steering Committee to in fact address this issue. And this very important collaboration began in 2007. At this point, I would like to just take a moment to acknowledge our National FASD Steering Committee and to thank them for their tremendous leadership and participation for the last several years. Dr. Gideon Corrin, Dr. Ted Rosales, Dr. Albert Chudley and uh, Dr. Rosales and Dr. Chudley are with us uh, on today's webinar. Dr. Stuart McLeod, Dr. Christine Locke, Dr. Sterling Claren. I want to recognize our senior project manager, Charlotte Rosenbaum. And 
all of the researchers and collaborators and many workshop participants who have truly been a part of this work since 2007. I would be remiss without identifying and thanking our partners from the Public Health Agency of Canada as well as our First Nations Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada as well. Today we're going to be focusing on three out of our five um, screening tools within our screening toolkit, and they are the neurobehavioral screening tool, the Asante Center probation officer tool, as well as our maternal drinking guide. And our speakers listed on the agenda before you um, are going to be um, directing their presentations to each one of these three tools. In 2010, at CAFC's annual meeting uh, in Winnipeg that year, we launched our official, um, we launched the screening toolkit. And it's very important for me to mention to everyone that in fact, we, um, CAFC, our National Steering Com uh, Committee, as well as our community, really view this screening toolkit as a work in progress. And I really want to stress how important that is to us and that I share that with you today. I'm emphasizing that because in fact the work that we're going to be doing together today is part of that uh, feedback loop, part of engaging with our colleagues across the country to in fact obtain your feedback in um, the current utilization of these tools and also what the future might bring in terms of enhancing the current toolkit, bringing new research and new tools to its content as well. So just to set that perhaps as the overarching objective of our work uh, today and over the next couple of years. As Doug mentioned, we have um, since March of 2011, we have um, facilitated a quite a number of webinars within our FASD series. And um, I would encourage you, if you haven't been able to participate with us, to have a peek at CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. And we're going to be bringing that uh, URL back to the screen um, for you to, um, to access um, probably several times throughout today's um, webinar. Without any further ado, um, I want to um, welcome and thank, first of all, I want to recognize uh, the leadership of, of Dr. Chudley and Dr. Rosales to thank them both so very much for that leadership and participation in this work. And um, at this point, um, I would like to turn the virtual uh, podium and microphone to Dr. Chudley, who is uh, kindly going to facilitate uh, this afternoon's presentations. Ab, thank you for being here, and uh, my pleasure to turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Elaine. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this afternoon. Uh, we're going through this rapid-fire presentation, dealing with the three screening tool uh, presentations. Uh, there was one yesterday on the meconium. And um, we really wanted to get feedback about uh, the tool and how people have been using it or intend to use it. And uh, it's important for us to give uh, feedback in terms of our own experiences and, and the intentions of each of these tools. And uh, over the last few months, it's been interesting to see the interest in the tools and uh, how they're being used in really creative ways. So it's an important part of issues related to FASD, and uh, I look forward to uh, the interactions with uh, all of you this afternoon and, uh, and beyond today's presentations. So I would like to um, introduce the, uh, the first uh, topic, and that's on the Youth Probation Officer Tool, the Asante Tool. Um, and um, I think uh, it's important to, to note that we, we looked at the, the use of this tool and its applicability to the Manitoba experience. We have the Manitoba Youth Justice FASD clinic and a program that's been operating for six or seven years that I think has been very highly successful and over 100 youths have been 
uh, diagnosed with FASD over that time period. We've had over 400 referrals. Uh, we wanted to look to see if this uh, youth probation tool would be useful uh, for us. And uh, some of the initial experiences will be presented by uh, Deepa. Uh, now, Deepa is a uh, PhD candidate in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. And her dissertation is uh, investigating characteristics and health care utilization of women who have given birth to children with FASD. She's worked with Healthy Child Manitoba on projects investigating the prevalence of FASD in Canada and at an international level and at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy. And she's going to speak on the Manitoba experience. So I'm going to turn it over now to Deepa to um, present to you um, our recent experience. Deepa. Great, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chudley. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Dr. Chudley said, today I'm going to present um, a study that we've been working on that evaluates the applicability of the Asante screen tool um, to aid youth probation officers um, to recognize young offenders with possible FASD here in Manitoba. So um, the FASD program in Manitoba began um, in 2006 at the Manitoba Youth Center, and it screens, diagnoses, and aids in the rehabilitation of young offenders with FASD. And currently, staff and probation officers um, are using red flags to identify youth who are at risk for FASD and then refer them for assessment uh, to the FASD program and then on to the FASD diagnostic clinic. Uh, but there's no consistent way to refer to the program. So the objective of our study was to see how valid and applicable the Asante probation um, tool is to facilitate FASD diagnosis um, in Manitoba young offenders. So our study was a retrospective chart review, um, and we included youth 0 to 18 years that were admitted to the um, Manitoba Youth Center between 2006 and 2009, and we only included youth who have um, probation officers. And the reason we did that um, was that this ensures that only charts with comprehensive information um, will be reviewed. For example, some of the youth um, are only admitted for one day and they don't have enough information to use the Asante tool effectively, and that would bias the results of our evaluation. There's, so 378 charts um, met inclusion criteria, and we conducted a pilot test of about 30 charts to test if there was adequate information uh, in the charts to use the tool, and um, over 50% of the charts had um, adequate information, so we proceeded with the remainder of the chart review. So here are the results. Um, 215 charts have been reviewed out of the 378, so I should say preliminary results. Um, and we, so we applied the Asante tool to these 215 charts, and then compared to the actual referrals that were made at the um, Manitoba Youth Center using their current method. So out of um, the 215 uh, charts reviewed, uh, 53 youth um, were screened positive by the Asante screen. Um, and out of these 53 youth, uh, 29 youth were actually referred to the FASD program using um, the center's current, uh, current method. Um, 18 um, youth screened negative. Um, so they didn't meet um, the Asante tool criteria, and none of these youth um, were flagged to the FASD program using their current method. Now, um, a large proportion of the youth, 112, um, did have charts. They did have um, information available, but they didn't have um, the correct information we needed to fill out the Asante tool um, and to make a definitive assessment um, whether these youth were screened positive or screened negative. And 32% um, the screen or 32 of these youth actually didn't have um, a pre-sentence report, which is the chart that we were using to extract information. Uh, so those we couldn't make any assessment. So um, we can say that the screening tool picks up more adolescents um, to be referred for assessment compared to the current referral method that the, the center is using. Um, and it's important to note that the information at times is difficult to collect. It's not explicitly in the chart and it's not explicitly asked by um, probation officers. 
you know, the intake to the um, Manitoba Youth Center is not designed to pick up youth with FASD. So some of the questions um, in the screen tool, such as if the youth has um, a sibling with documented FASD, was almost never in the chart. And the maternal alcohol his history um, was difficult to obtain. It's important to note that um, the results uh, may have changed over time. So um, although the intake is not designed to pick up youth with FASD, in recent years there's been more awareness of FASD at the Manitoba Youth Center, um, and staff may be picking up more children um, with possible FASD using their current method than in the past. Um, and the tool can only be implemented to youth with our relationships with staff who have a reasonable amount of information uh, about their family history and their cognitive and social behavior. Uh, so it can't be done on each child that comes in contact with the center. Um, the study shows that um, probation officers do need training to ask certain questions um, that flag FASD that are not being asked right now. And implementation of the tool would encourage awareness of possible FASD um, in this cohort. And um, a prospective study is needed that um, compares both methods of flagging youth um, with FASD before the tool is adopted. Um, and the complete results of our study will be available by the end of March. So if anybody um, would uh, has questions or would like those results, um, they can feel free to um, email me. And also there will be a more detailed sensitivity and specificity analysis available at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Um, we, in fact, are intending to do a, a phase two uh, because these preliminary results uh, are actually um, indicative of the possible utility in Manitoba for these, and uh, so we're excited about that. Um, I, I'd like to now move on to introduce the next speakers, um, Sheila Burns and Howard Bloom. They're going to talk about their the research in Ontario on this. Um, and uh, Sheila Burns uh, uh, is uh, uh, brings experience from Ontario. She's a founding member and past chair of the FASD Ontario Network of expertise and the network's first co-chair of the Diagnostic Capacity Working Group. Uh, the research in collaboration with colleague uh, Dr. Howard Bloom, who's from Georgia College, and community partners will identify the opportunities and challenges of implementing the Asante uh, screening tool for uh, probation officers in one region in Ontario. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bloom is uh, completed his uh, doctorate um, in uh, education uh, and, and counseling psychology at um, the University of Toronto. He holds a master's, degrees in, a master's degree in education with a specialization in human development and applied psychology. Dr. Bloom has worked with a variety of complex at-risk children and youth in residential, recreational, educational counseling and private consultation settings. And he's founded the Blooming Acres, a 17-bed residential care community for complex care individual as a full-time professor and coordinator at Georgian College with the School of Human Services Child Youth Program in Aurelia Campus. So with that, uh, I'll leave it with Sheila and Howard to take us through uh, the, uh, the next presentation. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, um, Ab, and it's uh, it's delightful to be here and to be um, to part to be part of the advancement of uh, capacity to um, to identify and address um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder um, in Canada and uh, Ontario specifically. Um, I, I think that it's interesting that you talked about the um, the. Uh, uh, Manitoba experience and I think that we were looking at opportunities to, to look at the Ontario experience and and what we what we know in Ontario is that um, that we are behind other provinces in the in the country um, uh, to uh, in in a coordinated response to address the F FASD in a coordinated response um, and that we have quite limited uh, diagnostic capacity and, um, and uh, limited uh, best or promising uh, practices that are being integrated into services. Um, so my work, what brought me to the college uh, and away from uh, provincial strategy work was a fellowship with the Law Foundation of Ontario, um, uh, uh, Community Leadership and Justice. 
um, because of the high rates of, uh, of victimization of individuals with FASD and uh, of uh, individuals being accused of and uh, crimes. Um, it felt like it was a, a it was timely to address FASD um, uh, through the through the justice perspective, um, and uh, so I've had it's been wonderful working with uh, with the college, uh, Dr. Bloom, and colleagues uh, in uh, Simcoe region as well. So we know that we we have limited diagnostic capacity, and we've got a huge province with a huge population, and how do we move forward and and looking at uh, existing resources was an, uh, an important uh, factor for us. Um, so we, we know that in Ontario, uh, having evidence-based uh, programming is, is important to government. And we also know that having something that's Ontario tested would be helpful. Um, so we kind of looked around, the, believing the screening tools are uh, an, an emerging resource that we could use. and uh, and in consultation with community partners, the um, youth in conflict with the law and the uh, Asante Center uh, screening tool was identified as an opportunity for research uh, that's an element of the fellowship. So uh, what we created was a collaborative project uh, working together with uh, uh, myself and Sheila uh, Burns, uh, who uh, is our fellow in uh, community leadership and uh, Sheila Davis with our uh, local Catalpa Community Support Services and Tanya Millsap who is an FASD project coordinator to uh, do two things. Uh, one is to uh, deliver an in-service around the use of the Asante tool and um, general knowledge around FASD but also to uh, test and explore the implementation of the tool within the Ministry of uh, Child and Youth Services here in Ontario. So really our hypothesis for the research is that if we train probation officers on a screening tool designed specifically to identify youth on probation um, who may have FASD, we, we will improve awareness, uh, we will improve knowledge, we'll improve its response and when considering client plans, probation orders, and or when recommending assessments, we will have a more seamless uh, process for uh, both the youth and, and the probation officers. Uh, so our research really is looking at a group of uh, youth uh, probation officers, uh, a one group pre-test, post-test design, uh, combined with some qualitative open-ended guided conversational interviews to explore uh, before they, the in-service to explore perceptions, ideas, knowledge, uh, implementation obstacles, and, and then to move forward to um, uh, you know, uh, training and post-testing. So the design really is working with 21 youth probation officers from Simcoe County. We want to pre-test uh, a self-administered administered questionnaire to establish awareness and a sense of eff efficacy related to FASD. Uh, our uh, community partner, uh, Tanya Millsap, uh, will deliver a six-hour training on screening tool and um, then we will post-test the group to really look at, um, you know, a uh, degree of confidence to use the Asante screening tool uh, to refer for diagnosis and, and to really explore if there, if there might be any perceived change in practice. Um, following that, we will um, uh, facilitate a guided qualitative conversational interview to really talk about uh, and explore implementation obstacles of the screen, how it will or may change practice, and then a few, a few months later we'll follow up with what uh, a follow-up survey online to dis explore whether something's changed in practice for these um, uh, probation officers uh, in terms of using the tool. The research itself will not test the reliability of the screening tool, but rather will provide some access to diagnostic services. And what we hope to learn in terms of outcomes is really uh, how, if at all, uh, the in-service training and the screening tool may inform uh, planning and policy programming uh, in terms of protocol uh, in the community, um, in looking at multiple ministries responsible for delivery of justice and correction-related services. We want to learn about um, you know, user experience on what is helpful, unhelpful, and where a screening tool is best placed, and really want to identify some uh, implementation barriers within the ministry. 
one of the uh, one of the pieces uh, the the background to this was that the Asante Center screening tool had been circulated to probation officers across Ontario, um, and uh, so that some of them had it available, but it was not implemented. So it's it's interesting and important to us that if this is a, a, a tool, um, what is needed. Um, to, to make it uh, uh, usable here in the province. Um, and we also appreciate that there are going to be challenges. While uh, Manitoba has uh, diagnostic clinics, that it, there is not that, that uh, resource or area has not been developed um, in a, a similar manner in Ontario so that it will have some impl um, implications on, uh, on delivery uh, once we get a, a positive screen where where does uh, where do we go from there? So we we believe that the screening tool is a, a wonderful platform to to um, to um, uh, to urge on the discussion of um, of best practice and the development of resources in the province uh, when when we are kind of far behind and and uh, and we're playing catch up um, to uh, to other provinces. The plan on the research itself and the in-service will take place in April and preliminary results will be available in June or July with a report to the ministry and it will be available to anybody who's interested in it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, that was very interesting and we're going to have lots of time to uh, discuss uh, uh, everybody's experience and uh, research plans uh, at the end of the uh, three session presentations. I do want to move on. Um, I wanted to introduce the next uh, speaker on the neurobehavioral screening tool, uh, Dr. Carmen Rasmussen. Uh, she, she's a developmental psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta in Edmonton and a research associate at the Glen Rose Rehab Hospital, also in Edmonton. She researches neurobehavioral functioning in children in FASD, and I'd like to pass it over to Carmen. Thanks, Ab. Um, so I'm going to be talking about our experience um, for a research project uh, looking at where we evaluated the neurobehavioral screening tool for children with FASD. Um, a student of mine, Michael Anne LaFrance, um, was involved in this, and Kelly Nash, Gideon Corrin, Gail Andrew, and myself. Um, this is based on a larger presentation where we presented the re these results. So I'm just going to skip over some of the slides um, in, to make sure I have enough time here. So we know that um, the, the screening toolkit consists of a number of parts, and we were specifically evaluating just the neurobehavioral screening tool. Um, this is the, the tool. I'm not going to have time to go through all the different questions and whatnot, but people can get the tool on the website and everything. So um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to determine whether or not the NST is able to differentiate between children that were already diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or with a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder one of the diagnoses on the spectrum, and whether it could differentiate them from other children with prenatal alcohol exposure but who did not get an SASD diagnosis, and as well typically developing control. So what we had is we um, administered the tool to um, the first two columns here represent um, the FASD and our PAE group. Or the PAE group are the children that have alcohol exposure that did not meet all of the criteria for FASD. So both of these groups were assessed for FASD um, at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital FASD clinic previously. And the first group, our FASD group of 36, did get an FASD diagnosis. And the second group were exposed but, but didn't meet all of the criteria for FASD, but they still definitely had alcohol exposure and alcohol score of 3 or 4 and still had some neurobehavioral impairments, just not to the degree required for FASD use. Okay. Um, well, okay, so we had, um, and then we had typically developing controls that we just rec re recruited through the general school system. So the average age was 12, 11, um, ages range though from 6 to 17 in all groups. So we did have a pretty wide age range. Um, the groups definitely differed on whether or not they were living, who they were living with. So our FASD and PAE groups, of course, were much more likely to not be living in their with their biological parents, whereas the control groups we're all living with a biological parent, and as well the number of previous living situations, but the groups didn't differ on overall FDS. 
Um, so again, here is a screening tool that various questions that are found to be predictive of FASD based on um, Nash and Gideon's um, previous research. So I, I don't think a lot of time to go through how it's scored, but you can get you know a positive screen, two different types of positive screens, and also a negative screen for FASD based on how the questions are answered on the tool. So we looked at the sensitivity, so looking at the ability um, to correctly identify individuals with FASD in the population that screens positive, and um, specificity, the ability to correctly identify individuals without FASD in the population that screen negative. So what we found is that um, we found that 36% of our of our FASD group and 14% of the PAE group um, and 0% of the controls screened positive, which was significant. So our overall sensitivity was actually relatively low, given that only 36% of the FASD group actually screened positive. Um, but the specificity was very high because none of the controls screened positive. Um, however, when we look at the separate, I'm going to do a breakdown of the questions and also the age of the participants. The older participants with FASD were much more likely to screen positive than the younger ones. So our, our positive rate was 50% in the 12 to 17 year olds and only 22% in the 6 to 11 year olds. And when we look at the breakdown by each question, it's, again, we can um, see more of, of why we had this overall low um, sensitivity. When, um, so this is each question here on the NSU, the 10 questions. And so here we have the percentage of um, FASD, PAE, and controls that endorsed each question. So that had a, that screens had a positive answer on each question, so acting too young for their age. You know, very high percentages in the FASD and PAE and low in the control. So the first column here, we compared the FASD directly to the controls. So as you can see, they're, they're highly significant from the controls on um, all of the questions. However, when you look at the endorsement rate, the last three questions, we had much lower endorsement rates among the FASD and PE. So this was the displaying acts of cruelty, bullying, or meanness, the stealing objects. So um, even though they still were significant, it was, endorsement rates were much lower on these ones. When we look at the FASD versus the PAE group, interestingly, um, there were very few differences because our PE group actually had very high endorsement rates, again, of showing that this, PA, this alcohol exposed group still does have significant um, neurobehavioral difficulties, even though they didn't actually get the diagnosis. And then again, when we look at the PE versus the controls, we see a similar pattern here. They were significant on most, but um, not on these last three items. So these last three items um, appear to probably be related to the fact that um, why we did have a, a low positive screen rate in the FASD group because not everybody was scoring positive on these questions, but we can't score the questionnaire with these questions out. And again, we also found that older children with FASD, the adolescents, were more likely to screen positiveness because they were necessary, they were more likely probably displaying these behaviors here, whereas six-year-olds maybe weren't doing the stealing and the, and the bullying and whatnot. Um, so basically, we do have a lower sensitivity rate of the NST, lower than what was shown in um, Kelly Nash and Gideon Corrin's previous research. Um, and we actually still have pretty similar patterns between the PE and the FASD group. And it's probably because um, a lot of the ones in the PE group, uh, like I said, they did have neurobehavioral impairment. Um, and a lot of them may actually be on the FASD spectrum and just may not meet the criteria requirements now for diagnosis, but perhaps when they're reassessed in the future, then they will be actually classified as FASD. Um, but despite our overall low sensitivity or specificity, or sensitivity, the specificity in our sample was very high, which helped support that um, selected items on the NST are specific to FASD and, and are not common in, in typically developing children, typically de developing controls. So, um, I think I will leave it there and just talk about some of our implications and whatnot. But basically, that, those are the results that, that we have found. Um, we are looking at hopefully doing a phase two to this research where, um, like I said, this, this first study, we looked at children who had already been through the clinic. And now we would like to look at um, using the tool prior to the children being assessed in the clinic. So before they um, 
as part of the intake package, we would use the tool and, um, and then look at, again, how well it differentiates the groups, but also look at how the different um, responses correlate with their actual cognitive and neurobehavioral results from the diagnostic testing. So, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, again, very interesting. I've got lots of questions, and I hope our uh, listeners also have some uh, questions that they're emailing to to Doug Maynard. And um, I'd like to move on to the uh, the next topic. That's the maternal uh, drinking guide. And um, Momita Sarkar uh, is going to be giving that presentation. And Momita has worked with with the steering committee over the last several years. And she has 10 years of professional experience in diverse areas of health, education, and prevention strategies. Uh, she holds a PhD from the University of Toronto with a collaborative degree in addiction medicine. Her doctoral thesis focused on the use of evidence-based screening strategies to identify women exposed to alcohol and other recreational drugs. Since 2000, she has held the position of coordinator for the Alcohol and Substance Use Helpline for the Mother Risk Program, Hospital for Sick Children. Momita. Hello. Thank you, everyone. Um, so today I'll be giving you a brief overview of the maternal drinking history tool and also go on to tell you about the progress in terms of um, how it's being implemented into the clinical setting and what the response and feedback of that has been. So to begin with, we're all aware of the fact that maternal drinking, prenatal drinking in pregnancy um, has deleterious effects on the child, uh, but yet up to 20% of women do continue their alcohol consumption at some level that is harmful to the fetus. In an effort to prevent this or in an effort to address this, uh, this, this maternal drinking history guide was developed so that it can be used to routinely screen all women of reproductive age um, and educate women who are not aware of the risks. So the first purpose of this history tool was not just to determine whether the mom drinks or has drank at a problem drinking level in pregnancy, but it was also um, developed to obtain accurate maternal alcohol use uh, information that can be used in the future for things like FASD diagnosis in the child, especially in cases of adoption where the biological mother may not even be present. In addition to this, it was also important to have this information to put in place harm reduction strategies for both mother and child. There are several benefits to this maternal drinking history tool that has been added as part of the FASD toolkit. First is that every aspect of the screening questions and methodology is validated. Secondly, the, it provides practitioners with several different options of screening. So depending on their type of practice, the patients they see and their comfort level in asking questions about alcohol or drugs, um, they can choose any one of these options that are available as part of the history guide. There's really no expertise that's required, and it's very easy to integrate the questions related to screening um, into the standardized intake forms that physicians usually use, among other questions related to lifestyle, such as do you exercise or do you, what is part of your diet. The first and most basic level of this option that has been included as part of this tool is the practice-based screening. And this basically involves asking one single question related to alcohol and combining it with motivational engineering techniques and supportive dialogue to elicit uh, uh, an accurate response from the patient herself. The second level of screening or second option is using structured questionnaires which make use of both a direct question as to how much and how often she might drink or indirect methods of screening using the taste or the tweak tools. The third level is very limited to only cases where um, child protection agencies might be involved. This is the lab-based screening tool. And the most effective of this has been shown to be the use of hair tests, which detects for fatty acid ethyl esters, a byproduct of alcohol that deposits into hair of both mother and baby. 
in this slide here, I've tried to outline all three different options and levels of screening that has been included as part of the tool guide, which you can access through the website. So when a patient is presented first to a physician or any other healthcare provider, after the introductory statement, at, at, at the very least, a basic question related to alcohol should be incorporated amongst other questions related to her diet or medications or exercise module. Um, Upon a question such as, do you ever enjoy a drink or two, if she responds positive to that, the provider can then may choose to go on to a second option of screening, which is the structured questionnaires, to determine if her alcohol consumption is actually um, complicated or on a social level. So is it harmful drinking or is it social drinking? And if she identifies as a problem drinker, she can then be uh, a brief intervention can be put in place, education can be provided, and referrals can be made. And as I mentioned before, the third level of screening is in cases where there is high suspicion but mom is denying use, but of course mom's full consent is required. So as part of this research, it was not only important to develop such a, a, a maternal history guide, but also to see if this tool is going to be effective and how it can be most um, accurate, most effectively uh, implemented into the clinical practice. And for this, we needed feedback from providers themselves. So in order to increase awareness and educate physicians, um, we went into two phases of this project. At the first phase, it was important to identify through what method this tool can be best utilized to screen for women um, of reproductive age. And this required the feedback of physicians. And from there, phase two was going to be measuring the potential effectiveness of this intervention in their actual clinical practice. So in December, Dr. Corrin went, went to, um, conducted a focus group in which he provided practitioners with two options of how they would prefer to gain the information about the screening tool and how that information can easily be accessible. Now, this was done with some assumptions of the fact that uh, providers often don't have the time uh, to you know, go for training. They also, a lot of this information is quite redundant, so the interest level as well and the fact of how easily it could be incorporated into their practice. And they were provided with two modules. First was the traditional module of lecture style about the guide, and the second was the case scenario module, which was the problem-based learning um, about the tool. Now, in the case scenario module, which seems to have been the preferred module in all 15 focus group participants that were there, uh, there was a case scenario of a woman who gave birth to a child with FASD and how this tool could have been used prior to pregnancy and during pregnancy in order to potentially improve on what the outcome was. In the second phase of uh, this research, this has not, uh, the part one has been conducted but the second follow-up is still yet to be, where we measured the effectiveness of this problem-based learning. So in this case, once it was identified that problem-based teaching would be preferred over a traditional lecture style of this tool, um, the case scenario was presented at weekly rounds in a community hospital to various OB uh, obstetricians and gynecologists. And uh, the presentation was rated by all participants as being outstanding. It was easy to understand and it was well received. The practitioners were then asked to go into their practices in the community and to use this tool, this maternal history drinking tool, and see how well it would actually work and if um, patients themselves would would um, 
respond to this line of questioning, which options they would prefer. And the results of that is pending, and in six months we hope to have the results to share with every one of you. But for now, um, the effectiveness of this is yet to be determined. So with that, I'll end the talk and hand it back to Dr. Chudley. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mamita. Well, that's the rapid fire portion of our webinar this afternoon. Um, I'd like to now move into the facility discussion. I'm going to ask uh, Doug and um, and uh, Ted uh, if they would uh, maybe uh, uh, join me in um, in receiving questions. Now, Doug probably has all the email questions, and uh, I'll ask uh, Ted if he could uh, chair this uh, this session. Yeah, so I, uh, I haven't received any questions yet uh, in the question box, so uh, that's just another reminder to those in the audience to, if you w would like to type in a question, go ahead and type it in. Uh, or if you would like to ask your question verbally, click the raise hand button and we'll do our best to uh, unmute you and give you a chance to speak with our presenter. Well, I, could, I could actually begin with the question myself. Um, and some comments. The, the, the proposed study in Ontario is uh, quite interesting, but I guess the difficulty is once you identify individuals as being screened positive, what, who uses this information and how are you using it? Our, uh, you know, we've always had a concern about misuse of screen tool information, of making assumptions, and that it, it can't uh, be equated to a diagnostic approach. So. I wonder if uh, you could comment about that, uh, Sheila or Howard. Oh, that's a that's a great uh, question. Uh, it is a kind of chicken and or the egg uh, kind of uh, issue here in Ontario. Um, if we don't identify it, um, we're not going to get the resources we need to 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 advance things further. Um, the community partner. Um, so we're certainly looking at at a, a di diagnostic. Capacity. I, I agree very strongly with you that a screening tool is not a diagnosis and should not. Uh, um, uh, it, it's simply information to kind of to to direct and should not be used uh, for diagnosis. And um, and work is being done to develop diagnostic uh, capacity. There's a partnership in Simcoe with Mother Risk. Uh, for diagnosis, um, and uh, and ho we hope that if we're getting information that tells us, even if it's not an FASD, but that there is um, uh, some neurobiological uh, or organic brain um, brain challenges a youth faces, uh, whether or not it's an FASD or or something else, that that needs to be addressed appropriately, rather than uh, through the uh, the typical. Um, uh, means of incarceration, uh, probation, probation orders that that reach out, um, um, but but I certainly I know exactly what you're referring to in terms of uh, screening is not in lieu of diagnosis. Yeah. Is that helpful? Thank you. I have a question back to you. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm wondering. Um, 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 if, I think it's back to you. The uh, prenatal alcohol exposure, the the kids who didn't meet the the criteria for an FAS. Have I got? Uh, am I am I right to be addressing this question to you, Ab? Um, oh, no, to are Carmen, we, I think. To Carmen, uh, sorry, Carmen. Are we looking at changing the uh, two standard deviations criteria related to um, um, the diagnosis? If we've got so many uh, um, alcohol exposed children. Uh, but who aren't meeting that threshold. So is the question about whether or not we should consider doing that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, we do have other research to show as well that um, the exposed children that come through the clinic still have, have, you know, significant impairments on the NST and in other measures that we've done with them as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's obviously something to be discussed by the clinicians and, and whatnot. I'm not saying to change the guidelines or anything like that, but I'm just saying um, definitely the one, the children that are exposed still definitely have some impairments for sure. Um, if it's not related to um, adjusting any guidelines, even in terms of um, services being available, not only to those with a diagnosis, but those with general exposure as well, I think it's, 
is, is probably important as well because these, these kids were um, definitely had a lot of behavioral issues. If I might ask you a question as well, is that okay, Ab? Sure. Uh, my question is uh, about that same research. What I found most intriguing about the uh, the numbers was that 53% cohort that uh, didn't have enough information to even um, you know have any kind of uh, uh, referral or assessment. I'm 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 you know very concerned that that's a, a significant number and wondering how and what's uh, being done to uh, support gathering more information so that those youth get the uh, support and referral, or at the very least, the, uh, the, um, the screening tool. Do you have any feedback on that? Well, some of these, <clears throat> they were done, um, some of these are no longer youth, so they're outside right. of the system. So uh, what our phase two is to, you know, have about seven probation officers gathering using the tool and the other referrals coming in from the other sources, like either through court orders from judges or lawyers or staff in the youth center uh, before sentencing, you know, we get referrals often that way or sometimes from the families. <clears throat> so we're going to compare those two streams uh, to develop the, uh, you know, to estimate the sensitivity of, of the tool. Um, our, our concern was that if half the kids that come in to the center are screened positive, uh, we don't have the resources diagnostically to deal with that. We see 25 right. a year. We'd have to be seeing, you know, 90 a year. Uh, we don't have the resources to do that. So I think mm -hmm. we need the good hold on the sensitivity and whether this tool really can can be applied generally and specifically in, in the, the Manitoba Youth Center. So it's a real problem about some of these tools. And, and uh, you know, the other concern and question was about the uh, uh, about these kids that are prenatal alcohol exposed and don't meet the criteria that is rather conservative in the Canadian guidelines. Uh, you know, I, I think the, all those kids that were evaluated because they were referred and they had uh, formal assessments that uh, said they didn't quite meet the criteria, but they probably all had brain twos. Otherwise, you, you probably wouldn't be looked at. Oh, I, very few of our kids that we see in our clinic have a brain two on a four-digit code scoring. So, but at least with our adult prison study, we did formal diagnostic assessments prospectively on 100 individuals and found 10% that met the criteria for diagnosis. But there was a huge group, 32%, that had cognitive impairment that could not be attributed to prenatal alcohol exposure. So, you know, this is a cognitively impaired group for whatever reason. Alcohol probably does play a role in in a substantial number or a very significant minority, but it probably doesn't explain all of them. So mm -hmm. I think we have a lot to learn. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so we have had a couple of questions come in. Um, we've got a couple of questions from Stephanie, if you would like me to read them, uh, Ab? Uh, yeah, Ted, Ted is our moderator, so. Oh. Hello, sorry. can you hear me? Yeah, Is we can Ted? hear you, Ted. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the first question, uh, she says, she has a question about the maternal drinking guide. So this is uh, for Momita. Um, she says, well, Momita talked about the use of this tool with physicians in Quebec. She works at a, uh, she says, I work at a children's mental health agency in Toronto, and she's wondering if it can be incorporated into their intake screening questionnaire on the phone. She's wondering what experiences people might have in non-medical settings in using, in using this tool. Okay, uh, I'm happy to, that's a very good question and um, that's on my part, I should have I concentrated on providers, but this tool actually, like I said, one of the benefits of the tool is that really no expertise is required. So it doesn't actually have to be done with anyone um, that has only that is limited with um, medical knowledge, so it indeed can be used among any frontline healthcare providers, um, even someone without any medical knowledge, because the questions are pretty basic. Basic, all the questions are laid out as part of the tool. When it should be used, um, it's very simple to use. So, to answer your question, yes, it indeed can be incorporated incorporated into those kind of questionnaires, and is encouraged to be. 
So anyone who deals with women of reproductive age should be, uh, I mean, should be fine to use this tool as part of their intake form. Uh, Amita, in yes? conjunction with, uh, with that, uh, is there any uh, plan to really do uh, uh, research uh, with uh, non-medical professionals? Well, I, I mean, I, if I didn't put that in there, it, the focus group that was conducted included providers including obstetricians and gynecologists, family physicians, as well as um, nurses. So, it, it, I mean, it, they were part of the group as well. So, yes, it, it, I mean, the, the phase two part of it will include um, non-medical practitioners as well. Uh, just my own personal comment, uh, uh, after practicing for almost 40 years, uh, I think the best uh, way to go uh, using maternal uh, uh, drink uh, guideline is really with the uh, non-medical people because they are really better in uh, doing it and, and, and utilizing it. Okay, yeah, no, absolutely, I, I agree with you. And in fact, even among the offices of family practitioners and OBs and ob guys, we found that it's the nurse who usually goes in to see the patient who has the time to go through some of the intake forms. So, you know, that that is definitely a very good point. Thank you. Any other question, uh, Doug? Yeah, we do have uh, one more question. Uh, she says, for the neurobehavioral checklist, what experiences might people in clinical settings or child protection ones have with this tool? And secondly, uh, how would you introduce this tool to a prospective parent? Can I answer that? Because I have plenty of experience uh, with uh, child protection. Uh, unofficially, uh, I've been uh, using this tool uh, as a part of a referral for a possible FASD issue. And uh, I do find, I did find it uh, quite uh, really uh, very good in uh, sort of choosing who needs to be seen, you know, earlier than later. So uh, it's a very good uh, tool for child protection workers. Okay. Uh, Car Carmen? I was just... I just wanted to, to mention that Kelly Nash is also on the line. I'm not sure if Kelly or Carmen, if uh, either of you had, a, had an additional comment there. Um, well, we didn't, um, we used the tool for research, so the way we introduced it was um, th that it was a research tool, and um, I think, I can't remember, Kelly, um, it, there are some direct instructions that go with it that you say to the parents, but, you know, clearly we said that your child might not, might not display all of these behaviors and whatnot, but because it was inter introduced in a research context, it was a little bit different. So, Kelly, I'm not sure if you want to add anything on there. Um, what would you recommend and have found works best with the tool is when it's in implemented as part of a general clinical interview, so where the questions aren't necessarily being asked in the order that they appear in the toolkit, but rather just to, to gain a better understanding of the child's functioning. And so it's with some clinical judgment that the boxes are essentially ticked. And we found that that is um, a more therapeutic way, if you will, of introducing the tool to families. Uh, I wonder if I could make some comments about <clears throat> how we're trying to use this in an innovative way. Uh, mm -hmm. We've actually modified um, yeah, the screen, the 10 questions, and, uh, <clears throat> and applied them when the teachers are administrating to kindergarten students the EDI, mm -hmm. and, um, and we're getting some very interesting results because we have an opportunity to link back later to diagnosis of FASD in, in the province and uh, also uh, track the uh, prevalence of those who screen positive on that, that tool over the years because the EDI and is given every other year. so. We think that this could be a, have a lot of potential for, um, you know, looking at the proportion of kids who would be screen positive, and, and tracking that over time, and then linking it to other systems, uh, uh, education, uh, health, 
social services, children in care, and uh, you know hospitalization, and to the FASD clinic. So we, we're really excited about the potential utility of that tool in an educational setting. And I think Ed, that's an excellent um, example of how it's a work in progress and how it can be adapted in different settings and what's so exciting about the kit. Exactly. It's Elaine, if I can just make a comment along those lines, uh, Kelly, that's exactly what I was just thinking. and I. I just just the conversation and the questions around opportunities to implement and use the tools. Um, this is exactly, of course, what the toolkit was intended for. And as people leave today's webinar and and uh, and and perhaps bring the tool, whether it's the NST or the um, maternal drinking, to your respective communities, if if you could provide your feedback as you begin to see the, the utility of the tool within your respective settings. If you could provide that feedback to us, that again is all part of the work in progress and, um, and we would really appreciate hearing back from you. Any other question from Doug? Yeah, so we have another one. This one's for Carmen. Um, the, she's asking, did, did I understand correctly that the neurobehavioral checklist is better at screening older children than younger children for FASD? Um, in our sample and in our study, yes, we did, we did find higher um, positive screens among the older children and probably was re just related to some of the behaviors, maybe not um, them not displaying until later childhood and adolescence. So yes, in our sample. We did find that. And I think we also have a question from Howard. Howard, if you wanted to just uh, go ahead and ask your question. Actually, the question is from Sheila, so I'll leave yeah. it to Sheila. Uh, um, no, it's uh, from Mamita about the. You mentioned uh, that that you use um, uh, FAEE uh, testing on hair for the infant and mother. Um, uh, but 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 uh, and then referred to mis the requirement for maternal consent. Um, but you didn't mention the use of uh, meconium, uh, which would likely give a, a more um, resilient uh, um, uh, uh, confirmation because it's. Uh, or am I wrong on that? Could you just talk about why the hair and not the poo? Sure, absolutely. Um, so. I just went over it very briefly. The actual tool in its complete form will have information with meconium as well. I just chose to just briefly verbally discuss the hair because usually um, in the context that most kids are seen, it's after the fact the biological mother might not be available. So meconium, if it's not collected right at birth or planned for that, then the meconium might not be collected and so we lose all way of collecting that information but it indeed is a very just as effective and eff a method of um, getting the information regarding the alcohol use as the hair is except with the meconium you can only get the information in the last two trimesters of pregnancy whereas if biological mother is present and hair can be collected um, and as long as she hasn't cut her hair that full nine months of what she may have uh, consumed in terms of the levels of alcohol consumption can be identified. Whereas with meconium, it's only in the last two trimesters. And, for the, and in the case where biological mother is not present, only the child is present, then the infant's first hair that is not cut, but the first hair in the first three months before it falls out, that hair also will reflect upon mom's alcohol consumption for the last two trimesters of pregnancy. But um, you're absolutely right. Meconium is just as valid a method of collecting that as um, as hair is. Um, um, if you, if you, if if uh, maternal consent is required, mm -hmm. why why wouldn't we just ask mom? Sorry? 
if maternal, um, if ethically maternal consent is required for the hair or baconium testing, why wouldn't we just ask her if she was, if she drank during her pregnancy? So a lot of times they are, I mean, obviously she is asked, but a lot of times she will deny it, yet practitioner might be aware of a history of her alcohol consumption, or there might be a relative that has disclosed that she did drink in pregnancy, um, or the infant could be showing signs of withdrawal, whatever the case might be, she may not be reporting it accurately. So this is why the lab, the lab, the third part or the third level of screening is only limited to specific situations where there's a high index of suspicion, but mom may be denying use or child protection agencies need the proof for court that mom has been drinking. And if the child becomes a ward of the of CAS, for example, in Ontario, then mom's consent in terms of obtaining meconium or um, in terms of uh, getting the child's hair, the infant's hair tested is not, like mom's consent won't be required because the child is a ward of um, CAS. So, so what, what are the ethics around, um, uh, so, that, so it, uh, that if, if mom doesn't provide the information, uh, doesn't provide consent, then she is at risk of having her child made a crown ward. Am I getting this right? So no, that, that is not. Then, 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 because somebody wants the information. So, how is that? What about the the? So that is uh, that is um, consent through coercion. Would you not say? No, that is that is not true. Um, but like I said, this the lab testing is only in situations right now where CAS is asking mother is for example, as one of the centers, there's lots of centers across the states as well, that, you know, this we have this child, the biological mother isn't present, um, and so, you know, we would like to see if there was any alcohol use. I am so not an... Even, it's, it's uh, I was, no, I was just going to say that I am not, um, I'm not the best person to talk about this because I'm not involved in the lab aspect or I'm not very informed about the exactly what the details are. Dr. Corin would probably be the best person to ask about this. He's not in the country right now, but um, there, there are specific um, criteria that's laid out. So if baby is with mom and mother's hair is, I mean, there is an indication of alcohol use or suspicion of alcohol use, then if mom if um, mother's hair needs to be tested, then the doctor will ask, well, you're, you know, there's no, um, you're saying that you didn't drink, so would you be okay or are you willing to give consent to having your hair tested? And many times mom will say, yeah, absolutely, go ahead. I know I didn't, so it's fine. And in many cases she might say no, in which case it will not be done. Sheila, oh, this is Charlotte speaking. This came up yesterday when we were talking about uh, meconium. And uh, Joey Carrieri, who uh, works at the uh, Mother Risk uh, Lab, uh, wanted to really emphasize that um, an indication of maternal uh, use of either alcohol or drugs is not ground for um, an immediate assumption that that parent is endangering their child or is unable to parent the child. So uh, a refusal to take a test, or even a positive test, would not, at least from uh, the way the mother is program, and as we understand it works in Ontario, not that it's not uh, manipulated in some cases, um, that this would in fact not happen. So it would not uh, the mother, it would not be, as you said, of course, consent, well, if you don't tell me, we're going to assume, and uh, therefore your child may be taken away. That's, that's not the procedure, as Joey uh, explained it uh, yesterday. Um, I, I, and I, I know that, uh, that the, the position on, on it has been that, it, it, that meconium testing should only be, that it is a prevalence tool. 
as opposed to a, a, a screening tool because of some of the ethical issues around it. So I was a, it, so it really ca quite caught me by surprise to see it referenced in in this piece um, uh, because because we know that uh, Joy did make a comment about uh, going to court and testifying, uh, so that we know that it's being used again. I, uh, in individual cases, and uh, and so that and so it just surprised me that it was being used. Uh, uh, it's, I, I wasn't expecting to see it come up on on today's uh, discussion, and I, I don't want to um, to take up too much time uh, about that. But um, I, just in terms of some of the ethical issues around uh, coercion and. Um, and it, and its uh, and its use um, at the implication that uh, that it's being uh, that a, a parent is not a good parent because they use alcohol or drugs, and uh, and how it's being leveraged in real life um, in some communities. So so that you know sometimes we have unintended uh, outcomes or unintended use. So uh, excuse me, uh, this that uh, we did have a session on the ethics of uh, doing a meconium testing in PEI, if I remember right, and a lot of your questions uh, have been uh, really discussed in, in that, And uh, uh, but indeed it happens that sometimes you do, do the testing without consent, and uh, this you have to really uh, later on justify for the sake uh, welfare of the child. It, it's sad uh, also the Professor Dickinson published based on that uh, workshop dealing with the ethics of meconium screening for alcohol, perennial alcohol exposure, uh, Professor uh, Dickinson did publish um, a, a, a perspective from a legal and ethics point of view in the Giddy's Journal, Canadian uh, Fetal Alcohol Research section of the Journal of Population Therapeutics and Clinical Pharmacology. Uh, over the last three months, so it's it's been published and it's been uh, you know, it's a very nice uh, discussion on the issues of ethics and 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 uh, morality as it applies to screening for this issue. Mm -hmm. And if I could, I, I, yes, I, I do. Sorry. I, uh, I just wanted to add that in terms of your question regarding as why it would be brought up as this part of this um, talk. The reason we had initially included it as part of this guide is simply to inform. The, the purpose of this tool is to basically inform people caring, practitioners that are caring for mom, that this is available. As I mentioned before, it's only very limited. Not This is not done routinely. We recommend level one screening routinely. We recommend level two screening when there's obviously uh, there's uh, the physician has the time or is inclined to ask, but the level three screening is there for providers to know that this is available so that if there's a case where after the fact there's a child in question or if, um, you know, during right after birth if the biological mom isn't available, that these are things that are available that can be done. So okay. it was... Uh, Doug, do you have further questions? Uh, maybe we can refer, you know, uh, all of us to the article that's been published. Doug, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I'm just I'm a question sure. Bernard something. Dickens, not Dickinson. He's listed yeah, there. Yeah, Bernard as... Dickinson. I do have the, uh, the pay, we do have the recording from Prince Edward Island where Bernard presented. Uh, it was a combined sort of live audience and webinar presentation and, and about the ethics of meconium testing and that is on the, uh, the Knowledge Exchange Network and we also have that was prior to the FACE conference in PEI. We also have the recording of Bernard's uh, presentation that he did the following day as part, a little more in-depth on the, the, some of the legal issues around the ethics of meconium test, uh, testing. So that's uh, certainly available for anyone in the audience uh, to view later on. Uh, we did have one other question, uh, again, for Carmen, uh, which said um, she was just asking where she can get a hold of your research and just wondering has it or when and where will it be published? Sorry, Sarah, I was talking with the mute on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the paper right now, we're just revising it and going to submit it to a journal. So um, it probably will be 
a bit yet before it's out in journal format. We're just um, working on sending it into publication. So, but I'm sure that somebody could email me if they wanted like a summary of the results or even perhaps um, some of the slides from the presentation or whatnot. I, I'm sure I could um, share some, some of that information. Doug, I'm just wondering uh, if you can just speak to, once again, the availability of the slides on CAN and that sort of thing. Yeah, for, uh, the, uh, again, this, this uh, session is being recorded and we will um, be uh, posting this on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, again, you'll be able to just find it uh, by either searching in the search box or in the FASD section. And if any of the presenters, those of the presenters that are uh, 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 allowing us to share their slides, we will, in addition to the recording, we will also post PDFs of their slides and any other links that they're sending. Uh, we do have uh, um, Ingrid Go has sent us the sent me the uh, link to the um, the, the um, CJCP journal on uh, article on PubMed on meconium ethics that we can also share with the audience as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, questions, remarks? Uh, we don't have any in uh, the hopper right now, so if uh, <laughs> there's any last minute questions that people want to quickly type in or raise your hand and we can uh, add you and add you to the discussion. Add? Yes. A any uh, remarks? Comments? Oh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy with the discussion we've had. It's been interesting. Mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly, be quite uh, you know stimulating discussion. And, uh, I, so, I wonder sure maybe we should. Are we ready for um, Charlotte then to uh, summarize? Yeah, the that's right. or? yeah I believe. That's right, I, believe Charlotte. I believe we are. Let's turn over to Charlotte now. Uh, Charlotte. Well, there are a couple of things that, that really stand out to me from this discussion. One of the things when we publish the, the toolkit, you know, whenever you publish something and it, it's in a fancy binder and it has laminated sections, uh, you think, well, this is it. It's, it's done. And uh, one of the things that uh, the steering committee has said all through that it's so important that this is a process that research continue, that the tools are taken up by both researchers and frontline uh, providers in the community and uh, test them in action. And I think that this uh, webinar has really demonstrated that that's happening, that uh, every time the tool is used, either in a research or a practical question, new questions arise and the tool will improve uh, as that uh, process develops. Also, I think the wider use of tools, as Sheila says, it, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. We need to be able to uh, demonstrate uh, that uh, there is a large pool of at-risk uh, children and youth who require um, diagnosis, and we, and we must build that, that capacity um, within the community. And I think something that, that is also a theme in, in all our discussions uh, with the steering committee and uh, we've seen throughout our uh, two webinar, th these most recent webinar series and before, is that we're not talking about one identified individual here when we identify a child or youth. We're really talking about the uh, two, as, as Gideon Corrin is, is on the same, we have two patients, the mother and the child, and indeed the first studies that identified SASD and followed the, um, the mothers of these children, found mothers that uh, had incredibly difficult lives and problems and, and were receiving no care or treatment. Uh, as Stuart McLeod said yesterday, this is a totally preventable condition and um, we mustn't forget the importance of those primary prevention uh, activities that uh, can prevent this, this whole sequel of events from occurring. So that's kind of my, my broad summary. Um, a lot of the research that's been discussed today will, will come to CAFC for its final uh, report to uh, the Public Health Agency at the end of March. So it was very, uh, very exciting to, to hear those, those results uh, begin to come in. 
Our next step uh, as steering committee is a proposal to um, the Public Health Agency of Canada again for the years 2012 to 2014 to do some of the work that, that Ab and, and others have uh, already described. And we're hoping very much to get funding to continue this really community dialogue about screening and the tools. And uh, hopefully it will run in parallel to the other wonderful research that uh, is being done in the community and that we'll have uh, other opportunities to, to share our findings and, and progress. I think that's all for me. Uh, Elaine, would you like to make some final comments? Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I just want to uh, really reiterate um, just one point that Charlotte made and that is that research needs to continue, is continuing, and will continue to inform the development, further development of our screening toolkit. And um, I, I think that's one of the most important messages that um, I can relay to everyone on behalf of CAFC and our National Steering Committee. Um, we are very committed, we at CAFC are very committed to continuing to share and disseminate new knowledge as it becomes available in our development work. And um, as Charlotte alluded, um, we are continuing our work in partnership with the Public Health Agency of Canada and anticipate um, further development. As that is ongoing, as we receive the final results of the um, <clears throat> pilot studies that have been described to us today, um, we will invite everyone to come and join us at uh, webinars 9, 10, and 11 as we um, disseminate um, that new knowledge. So um, in the meantime, if you have feedback to provide to us, we would be most appreciated, appreciative because again, we're really reliant on, um, on that communication loop. Um, I think at, um, at this point in time, I think we're right, uh, right at um, just about three o'clock Eastern time, and um, I want to be. I want to end by thanking Ab um, for the wonderful facilitation of today's call. Uh, Ted, our our appreciation to you as well. Uh, to Doug for your technical expertise and um, keeping all of this running and juggling. Um, it's uh, it's most appreciated. Um, I think at this point we'll, um, we'll close today's webinar with a thank you to our participants and certainly look forward to our next event. Thank you, everyone.